joining on our innovation talks and uh, hopefully we'll have a number of people following us uh, online as well uh, on YouTube. Uh, but most importantly, this is a recorded session uh, that I'm very much looking forward to, to, to for people to come in late and see. Uh, and I know from the beginning of this initiative, you got a number of interesting use cases and design reference architectures that you have explored uh, that potentially could uh, revolutionize uh, some, if not all, of the way we do uh, uh, things in healthcare, in supply chain, and in uh, in, in in healthcare uh, and clinical trials, not to forget. So uh, I think the scene and the stage should be all yours uh, to basically blow us away with uh, the use of blockchain and pharma. Let's just work on that. So uh, thank you, Jesper. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, so we're delighted uh, to present to you today the, the blockchain project Pharma Ledger. And uh, my name is Henrik Nielsen. I'm with Global Regulatory Sciences in, in Novo Nordisk and, and work on some of the regulatory aspects of this project. And I brought uh, several uh, really competent uh, colleagues uh, today and now Dan will start sharing the slides. Uh, we like to have this as interactive as, as possible, um, but what we really encourage you to do is to uh, write questions in the chat and then we will sort of group them, put them together and, and ask them to the uh, to the experts. But if uh, then you move along to the next uh, slide, we have uh, prepared an agenda for you today where Dan Fritz, who is the um, the head of the uh, the industry head for the Pharma Ledger project will uh, present on on blockchain and and the project itself. And then uh, Ken Thursby from um, MSD and Patrick Meyer, also from uh, Novartis, will present on the uh, electronic product information and also a, a an app that has been created. And then. Uh, Marco Como from Novartis will come back and uh, present the um, the architecture and some of those those details to you. And I would uh, just ask my colleagues to briefly present themselves when they they first start presenting. So with this uh, brief introdu introduction, uh, let's move ahead and uh, for every one of you uh, watching this, uh, please uh, ask questions in the chat. Over to you, Dan. Thanks, Henrik, and thanks, Jesper, uh, for this opportunity to give an introduction to Pharma Ledger today and to a little bit of blockchain itself. This is, uh, I think, uh, should be interesting for the whole audience because we're going to take you from the overall project to a specific use case to the underlying technology. So it's really kind of a, a, a vertical dive into one specific use case, which um, we think holds a lot of promise. Let's start just with those that are not familiar with uh, blockchain, uh, just a very short introduction. And I um, use the five A's uh, to, to evaluate use cases or to think about the applicability of blockchain. What is it good for? It's good at assets, at managing assets. It's a ledger. Uh, and everybody is probably familiar with Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies, but uh, in this case, assets can also be uh, products, so medicine packages, or it can be data um, to, to do the um, integrity of data and the provenance of data and products. So it's very good at managing assets. We're in the healthcare industry. Uh, it's a regulated industry. Therefore, um, audits or the mutability of uh, our manufacturing processes and, and, and everything is, is basically audit trailed. And uh, there's no way to, to, to cheat on a, on a blockchain uh, without um, broadcasting what you're doing. So um, it's very transparent, open, uh, and, and no changes allowed. Um, we believe that blockchain holds big promise in terms of automation. In the future, you've maybe heard of smart contracts. When we are able to um, uh, automate different um, actions that are currently done, also removing paper and human intervention and human error, um, this this holds a great promise in the future. 
we also believe it's important for anonymization um, to protect data privacy, but also the confidentiality of different um, organizations' data. So it's very good to an manage access um, to what people need to know. And last, not least, but maybe most important, uh, is all for one and one for all. Uh, we have to have a consensus on the solution we're going to use. We have to agree all together on the on the standards. And there's no one organization that's in control of this whole thing. That's the that's one of the principles and themes of blockchain. So the five A's, um, which uh, which I, I like to use to explain blockchain. So what is Pharma Ledger? Uh, Pharma Ledger, in a nutshell, is an IMI project, uh, an innovative medicines initiative project. Uh, IMI is a joint undertaking between the European Union and the FPIA, the European Federation of Pharmaceutical uh, Industries and Alliances. And uh, this is a multi-year uh, program under Horizon 2020 um, for health innovation. Uh, IMI is, is a great umbrella for Pharma Ledger, actually just uh, pr pretty much a perfect vehicle because it's about projects that are too expensive or too risky or benefit from public partners and public expertise and public skills. And that's what uh, we have and what we need in, in, in a blockchain consortium. We need a, a mechanism to bring us together to share the risk, to share the cost and to, and to benefit from innovation and expertise that's out there. Pharma Ledger's three-year project, it kicked off last year in January. We have 29 partners and you can see them there. Uh, there's uh, 12 uh, industry partners. Uh, Novartis is uh, the uh, uh, industry lead of this and I'm the uh, industry project leader uh, for the Pharma Ledger project. I'm normally a, a supply chain technology architect at Novartis. That's my day job. Uh, the, the project is funded with public resources and with the industry contribution at 22 million. And it's looking to deliver or to prove the value of blockchain in three areas, which is supply chain, clinical trials, and health data. We're joined with a number of hospitals, universities. We have patient, tech, patient organizations, technology companies. And the, the ultimate goal is really to prove the value of blockchain, not only to um, you know, the industries and the ecosystem, but primarily to the patients, because we are all patients, actually, and can benefit from being empowered and engaged on, on, on health care, which is, you know, really the most important thing, our, our health. How do we want to do it? This is a, uh, uh, a common blockchain-based platform um, with reference use cases in a pre-productive environment, meaning this is not actually setting um, solutions live, but it's improving the value and preparing to take them into production uh, at the conclusion of the project. Um, and in order to do that, we need to do some other things. So that's that's talking about the the uh, governance of a solution, uh, not during just during the project, but after the project ends, who is going to oversee, manage um, the operations of a common platform in the future. It's about engaging with regulatory and um, and uh, data privacy and, and legal experts on the applicability and the compliance of these um, of these applications. One reason is why we're here uh, with the Danish Medical Agency today. And um, yeah, I think that's uh, kind of in a nutshell uh, the the goal. Um, one one other goal just to mention, it's really about, um, it's not a club here, it is, it, we want everything we're doing in this project, we want to share, we want to share it as a, in an open source manner, we want to share it with, you know, no software licenses or anything like that, um, and coming with installation, adoption instructions, um, that's really the big part around awareness, reaching out and sharing what we're doing. To, to bring people into the fold about what the blockchain vision holds. So I, I think I mentioned the, the objectives in terms of the sustainable um, uh, blockchain architecture, three different um, uh, domains that are being um, looked at, uh, health data, supply chain, and clinical trials. Today, we're gonna zoom in a little bit on, on, on supply chain um, with the 
the EPI, Electronic Product Information. Um, I think uh, that uh, these um, comments or the the information here basically confirms, you know, what we had in the in the previous slide on on Pharma Ledger. But um, this is basically putting it all together um, in in one view for you. Uh, where are we in the in this project? The first year was really focused on uh putting the or bringing everybody together as a team um and doing a use case prioritization so which which use cases will we actually focus on and deliver and the initial uh investigation and analysis of the um legal requirements data privacy requirements but also on the technology side the the architecture and the proposed approach for that in the in this year, we're um, actually now developing these demonstrators. That's what you're actually going to see today for EPI, but also looking at some other areas and again, governance, which is so important, and also outreach, awareness, and education. Next year, um, we hope to have completed some pilots of the different solutions that we've um, evaluated, the value that they bring. We've communicated and disseminated the results of the project and um, and uh, have set up our governance to oversee uh, what happens with Pharma Ledger after the project ends. Uh, one, uh, one thing to mention also is that uh, in addition to the 29 partners, we are joined with some advisory board members, some experts, that's where we value Jesper's input on the advisory board. Uh, which uh, provides a lot of good expertise and direction for the project. So what are the use cases that we actually are looking at? This is, this is the, the set um, in the, the three domains. Um, just uh, for example, clinical trial recruitment looks to match uh, health profiles anonymously with open clinical trials. So kind of a matching algorithm um, in order to facilitate uh, the recruitment of uh, participants in clinical trials, which is one of the biggest challenges. Um, integration of IoT devices, IoT data in a trusted manner uh, for um, healthcare. E-consent or uh, electronic informed consent form, the documentation that everyone has to sign um, in order to participate in, in, in clinical trials. In supply chain, we have uh, two versions of uh, supply chain traceability, tracking and traceability, one for clinical um, products and the other one for finished good uh, traceability. Um, and then we will get uh, more information here on, on electronic product information, but one that I just wanna call out because I know um, this is the around analytics and it's around data, but it's um, anti-counterfeiting. This, this use case I'm actually personally co-leading. And one of the aspects is to verify the authenticity of products using a number of different um, checks, um, including serial number and status and registration, um, but also uh, and, and, and authentication features but it's also um, intended to use the data that is generated from those checks to identify um, trends or, or larger issues um, around the counterfeiting issue, which is which is growing and which in you know uh, in some areas, three out of ten products in a developing country could potentially be any counterfeiting or falsified. So there, there's a big um, data analytics aspect in this anti-counterfeiting one, as well in, as in the other ones uh, too. So with that, um, I think that's the quick overview of Pharma Ledger. I, I hope that uh, uh, made sense and uh, we will definitely can take questions later. But now I'd like to turn it over to, to Ken Thursby uh, for the introduction to the EPI use case. Hey Dan, before you go there, there's, there's a question in the chat uh, already, which is great. Um, it's on the uh, medical device IoT, and the question is along the lines of, is this intended for new devices or also could it apply to existing devices? 
Uh, it is uh, both. Um, I, the idea is that it would be easier with a standard set of integration and a standard way to identify devices and, um, to integrate data from both of them, you know, so new or, or existing. So um, the, the, it's, uh, we're not looking to you know, create new, new devices or anything like that, um, but um, leverage and make it easier actually for um, IoT device manufacturers to, to kind of you know, bolt on to the solution or to leverage their devices for, for this kind of data gathering and acquisition. So, okay, I, I think that answered that one. So I'll turn it over to Ken for API. Thanks, Dan. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Ken Thursby. I'm uh, working for MSD in Global Supply Chain Management as a Digital Transformation Lead. I'm also co-leading the e-leaflet use case in Pharma Ledger. Um, so first of all, uh, what is a, an API? Hopefully. Most people on the call will, will know, but just for level setting, it's a digital version of that picture you can see on the left hand side. That's a, a typical leaflet that you might find in a pharmaceutical pack that has information like ingredients, how to take your medicine safely, um, what side effects there could be. And there's a person behind that leaflet just for scale. And these things are getting bigger. Um, there's lots of known issues with the paper leaflet today not least readability, um, being able to search the text for the thing that you want. Updates on instant. So in today's paper world, we need to um, design the leaflet and we need to uh, print it, fold it, put it in a pack. It goes through the distribution channels. The old stock gets used up before the new stock's available. So it can take some time and, and that limits access. And then of course, these things are costly to produce and there's an environmental impact. We produce billions of these things every year across the industry. Um, E-leaflet itself isn't a new idea. It's been around for about a decade, from what I can tell at least from the folks I'm speaking to. Um, why hasn't it happened if it's such a good idea? Well, the answer is not black and white, it's complex, but there are multiple factors. One is the um, technology readiness. I mean, if you look at where we are now, from 10 years ago, ubiquitous use of mobile phones, technologies like blockchain, allowing us to share data in a trusted way, because there's a lot of misinformation out there on the web. I mean, these are a couple of uh, examples of things that have changed in the last 10 years, which um, would enable the change. And then of course, the health authorities around the world, um, they have the keys in that if e-leaflet is to happen, then it needs to be part of the regulations and health authorities around the world are opening up to the idea that e-leaflet could be ripe and uh, that you can see uh, some of the guidance. This is from the European Medicines Agency. There are similar things going on around the world with um, guidance, public consultations, and there's a few pilots in what we would call pioneer countries around the world. Um, next slide, please. So um, what's the pharma ledger vision for this? Well, using the blockchain as the transaction infrastructure, we seek to connect the, um, the main ecosystem players in the e-leaflet value chain. So health authorities, manufacturers, and patients together. We see the e-leaflet being digitized. It's not just about putting uh, a PDF on a phone. This is looking at it across its entire life cycle from creation of the content through the review and approval process uh, into dissemination. And the reason we want to do this is because we see that there are benefits um, to each of these ecosystem players. So we start from the left hand side with health authorities. What we see from a manufacturer side is um, each of our product has a leaflet. They get updated many times during the life cycle. Um, we as a single manufacturer might see dozens of products, but you as a health authority are gonna see thousands of products. And there's an administrative burden for the exchange of data and information through the review and approval process, which we think could be simplified and modernized, especially 
to allow modern content like videos and audio and other things that are now available to us. Um, there's an opportunity with um, with the, the patients as well to get their um, information from a source which is simple. So instead of having multiple uh, apps from each manufacturer, why not make it an ecosystem solution where as a patient, I can just get my medicine uh, information regardless if it's Novartis, MSD, GSK or whoever. So by using the blockchain, we're seeking to create advantages and benefits to all ecosystem players to help catalyze the change from analog paper to digital. Um, we want to do this um, using a mobile device and a scan of a barcode. You can see that highlighted in the bottom right hand corner. Uh, if we go to the next slide, we'll talk about why that barcode is important. So um, that barcode that you see is something called the GS1 2D data matrix. It's the de facto standard for serialization in Europe and uh, dare I say the world. Um, there are other serialized codes out there, but the principle of this barcode compared to the barcodes of old is that there's uh, a rich set of data within the barcode, which is used across the value chain for different things. So by using this barcode, to access the e-leaflet, you also open up a range of possibilities of providing other digital services that don't exist today. So for example, um, the GTIN, the Global Trade Identification Number, that's your product number, you could give a product specific leaflet because that data tells you which manufacturer, which product and so on. If you look at lot number, you could give a batch specific leaflet if that was something you wanted to do. What about recall? So we always recall by batch. That's how we do it today. You could post to the blockchain as a manufacturer that there's a recall, which uh, when somebody scans the product to dispense it, that would improve patient safety because the recall is being stopped at that point. Expiration dates, another interesting one to give you an example. You could choose to do dynamic product expiration using the COVID vaccines as an example. They've got short, short shelf life because we haven't amassed the stability data. But as we get more stability data, you could dynamically extend the expiration date, which could reduce shortages. It could make sure that product isn't wasted, save money. And uh, in the case of COVID vaccines, you know, save lives. So those are just some examples of how we can use that existing asset from serialization the industry spent hundreds of millions of euros on for e-leaflet and other exciting use cases. Next slide, please. So we, we are global pharma companies in Pharma Ledger, and although we're Europe centric in the work we're doing right now, we recognize that having a global platform and a global solution is advantageous um, to running business and serving more patients. So what you see at the top is the range of uh, serialized barcodes. That's like the gold standard, if you like, for um, a digital key. But there are other digital keys out there. And I'll just use the example of the bottom ones. They're your standard universal product codes that you get on supermarket products and more importantly, OTC medicines. So you could open this up to OTC medicines by scanning that code just to get a basic EPI. Of course, you won't get the added digital benefits, but um, over time, who knows, um, maybe barcodes uh, will, will move to the data rich standard. It just gives you a sense of the inclusiveness and the art of the possible with the barcode as the digital key. And with that, I'm going to hand over now to uh, to Patrick to take us through the next segment. Hey, Ken, uh, I think we have a question and maybe if you can go two slides back uh, and, the, and the question says, uh, do the HCP and patients contribute to the blockchain? Um, this is it's an interesting question. So when you think about uh, the data that's put on the blockchain for eLeaflet, that's clearly the manufacturer. Um, but then when the when there's a scan of the code, um, 
what happens? Well, at the moment, that's read only. But in the future, if you've got tra other transactions happening, that could be a, a two way data exchange. Yeah, I don't know, Dan, would you like to add anything on that one? Uh, I think that's that's it, right? It's public publicly available um, in the uh, in the beginning, but uh, the number of use cases that build on that, I think Patrick will will show some of that shows where there is definite inter interaction and uh, in the in the solution. So okay, so let's move on and then maybe we can revert to this question. Um, thanks, Dan. Uh, hi, all. Um, my name is uh, Patrick Mar. I work for Novartis within the global engineering function. I'm one of the responsible persons in Novartis for um, serialization and product tracking. So for the EU, for Russia, China, US, Brazil, etc. I'm also one of the EPI um, responsible persons. I've been working with Pharma Ledger and with Ken in particular on EPI for the last year or so. I'm the co-lead for this. Um, over the next few slides, I hope to give you an idea of what's actually involved in this, because it's more than just an app. And as Ken said, it's not just about putting a leaflet on a phone. And Dan alluded to the same thing. There's a lot more to this than that. Um, I hope this presentation will be useful to you all. And if please ask questions. Please feel free to ask questions as, as and when you have them. And, and it's also important to note that we don't have all the answers to all the questions right now, and nor do we know all the questions. So as we go through these things, we're learning different things and, and exploring different options and possibilities. What we thought was possible or the right approach may not be. OK, so that's that's where we are. So the, um, what I'd like to show you now is what essentially goes on in the pharma company, because we can see there from this slide, we're going to scan a code and we're going to go into the into the, in our instances the pharma company potentially, and then we we'll return the leaflet. But what actually happens? Something has to happen inside the company. So inside, I would like to explore this one which, for the next few slides. Next slide, Dan. Yeah. So you can that's so typically into that you can hold it there, Dan, for a moment. So it, it typically in our in the pharma companies, we have got all our systems of record. We have our serialization, our master data, we have where we keep our uh, our labeling information, we have regular reporting potentially, we have the possibility of resubmissions, etc. for certain markets. We do batch release, etc. So that's typically what we would have. Just they're more generic. So next piece, Dan, please. So what we're looking to build on now is um, this DSU fabric. So this is where we would essentially manage products and batches that are associated to for the EPI and the other use cases. So keep stepping through that, please. And within that, then we have this DSU, the DSU storage. Marco will give you more details on this later. And then there's the blockchain component. And then I, that could be managed by a third party, but for most of the pharmaceutical companies and, and particularly in Novartis' case, we would then include that within our four walls. So you can step down, please. So that is essentially becomes in our four walls, right? So that's all it becomes Novartis in, in, in my case, uh, all our systems. So then we have interfaces to different parts of it. You can keep, you can keep, keep stepping through that, please. So we have all this. So the, the other, the, what's important to note here, you can hold it there down for a second, um, it's important to note here is that we don't put any, the leaflets don't go on the blockchain. The serial numbers don't go on the blockchain. What we put on the blockchain is this so-called anchor. So basically what we do is put, in a, for want of a better description, a, a link to where the information is stored. And that's the, what's on the blockchain. And then as other companies stand up their equipment and nodes, um, the different blockchain nodes will be synced. So essentially that's how all of the blockchain, that's how we connect everything. So, so MSD will create a similar environment, uh, uh, GSK, etc they will all produce the same sim similar type of thing and we will work from that point and then all the blockchains will be talking and that's where we can get the codes for each of our products so you can just step on down please so the, one of the important things here is this the, what we're calling this back-end integration to get from our systems of records to this dsu fabric um th that's that's critical to this because we produce many many hundreds of thousands of batches and there's many many millions of serial numbers etc you can't manage this manually so it, there has to be automated systems in place to make sure the data is there that the data is checked the data is correct that when we do release batches for example to the market that everything is correct like we do currently for the um 
the EU FMD, we ensure that the data is distributed before we would actually release the batch. Very, very similar type process has to go on here. So this is a lot of a lot of uh, um, activity that needs to happen within the companies. Now you may be wondering, oh, well, why don't you just go to a central location, some central database for the leaflet in um, Europe, for example? Well, we have many different registration procedures, and the other point here is that we also have the necessity, or potentially the necessity, to have batch-specific leaflets, and we can't do that if you're going to a centralised location. So, from a pharma ledger perspective. Um, we deliver the specification and the software packages and then within the pharma companies um, we would then install um, all the necessary infrastructure we do the necessary back-end integration all, all of this kind of stuff has to happen within there so okay next one dan please so with epi right what, and what we've discussed so far has been we, we talked about blockchain we talked about dsus we talked about then blockchain nodes the back-end integration and it's very technical right but uh, you can step through this down please so there is a technical component to it it's only one part of it right but then you need the regulatory policy the active uh, regulatory engagement engagement with the health authorities for adoption then we need to have the country quality and commercial organizations involved they know best how to deal with it in their specific countries what may work in one country may not work for another one the supply chain and manufacturing so today if we if we were to take out leaflets in the packs the leaflets are there in some cases to protect our products they, they were always there so they were used as that if you no longer have them there we may have we would have to do some additional activities on the manufacturing lines it could bring us some efficiencies of course from an environmental perspective as well but also um but it, it does require it does require some um work as well from technical perspective then we have the brand protection falsified the falsified medicines part of the businesses that we all take care of and then we have the communications aspect of this i mean i always give the example like how would my mother know where to get the app and what to scan all of these things have to be asked and what about those people that are not um, digitally literate how do we manage this now that question is not specific for epi that's a general question asked if you're going digital at all right so all of these things have to be managed uh, accordingly so uh next one dan please <coughs> Yep. So what we've started off here with, well, we call this the bundle, the stack. Essentially, we're starting off with EPI. <clears throat> um, so then we wanted to build upon this additional stuff like anti-counterfeit checks, which I hope to show you over the next few slides. Um, then building batch recall. Now the batch recall wouldn't be to replace existing um, processes. It would just be an, an addition to them. Um, you could re uh, you could recall on <clears throat> the batch level, potentially or on the serial number level. Uh, we're looking at doing adverse event reporting. Where would they report the adverse events to from the patient perspective? Um, then there's, there's other ones, electronic health records, finished goods traceability, the clinical, uh, clinical decision support systems, and ultimately we want to get to a blockchain enabled healthcare system. Now, it wouldn't necessarily be the case that the pharma companies would be involved in every single one of these uh, things, but the idea is to build a platform that would allow it to occur. Okay. Um, next one. So Patrick, yep. we have a question okay. we, which is uh, about standards. So maybe the next slide is a good one. So it, it says, um, to what extent does Pharma Ledger solution align with or build on um, existing GS1 initiatives like Digital Link or GDSN? Yeah, we. Um, yeah, for the for the. Well, we, we are not actually using um, the digital link. We've evaluated it, um, but for what we wanted to do, we we found that um, it wasn't optimal for us. So, but we are looking at that. We, of course, use the GS1 standards for the coding. Um, the, when we scan the codes, we, we can scan both GS1 codes and non-GS1 codes. <clears throat> you will see that back from um, the, a few slides back where we showed the, the code for China, for example, which is the code 128. We would look to scan that as well. So that's that's what we're looking at, and all of this system. This is very much um, we're all aware of Spore, but um, there's a huge master data element to EPI alone, right? It was it's very similar to serialization. One of the big challenges we all had with serialization was the master data, making sure that was correct. And this is going to be no different. Now we're at the advantage in the EU, in particular, that we have all our master data issues resolved. So that will be a huge a huge benefit there. Okay. Um, next one. 
if, if there is no more, I, I, sorry, I can't see the questions that are coming in. Um, <clears throat> for those of you who would like to play along, um, if you scan this QR code, uh, you can get the access to the app. Now, this is only for demo purposes. Uh, you, you will be uh, you'll be able to scan some codes, etc. But uh, we will be wiping this um, clean in the next weeks as we do development activities, etc. But uh, it may give you an option uh, to test it out. Um, if you just scan it with your iPhone, it'll it should ask you to open a, an app, and you can you can then essentially save it on your um, home screen and it, as an app. It's a it's a progressive web app. Okay. Um. So Dan, then our next slide, please. <coughs> So over the next three slides, I'm going to give you, um, uh, there's a, I believe it's nine um, different scenarios that we have here. And then I would like to give you a quick demo. I'm, I'm conscious of the time. So um, th on this slide, we have essentially what we call the happy path scenarios. Um, so we have products there. You can see we have products from Novartis, uh, GSK and Merck. Um, so uh, we can scan each of those codes and get the information. It's, presented, it's always presented the same way uh, to the patient. And they, the patient would see no difference, or the healthcare practitioner would see no difference. Um, number three and four may be of interest because in that instance, it's the same. You can just go back down, please. In three and four, it's uh, we're going to look at a batch specific leaflet in that in that instance, um, just to show we can technically do so if needed. It may be needed. It wouldn't be necessarily every single batch, but it, it's a it's a potential over the life cycle of our product. The next slide, Dan, please. <coughs> Um, and then um, these are we're coming into the unhappy path scenarios. And uh, number five here is a the serial number is unknown. Okay, it wasn't part of this batch. Um, number six, the expiration date in the code is actually wrong. So and then and then number seven is the product has expired. Um, for numbers five and six, there's something wrong, right? The, the why was why isn't that serial number known? Why is the why is the data in the barcode wrong? In the case of six, so. <clears throat> We are showing the leaflet in this instance, but uh, in, in the current version that we have, but we're looking to question, we're questioning should we show the leaflets or not in these in these examples? And then number seven, what kind of message would you show to the patient um, to, to show them that, uh, to tell them, okay, there is something wrong with this or the product has expired. You don't want to be scaring people, but there may be some reasons why, why we want to show a message to them. And then next slide, please. And then eight and nine, um, these are kind of the more boarding on the anti-counterfeiting types of checks. But um, in this example, the batch number is not known. So let's call it that this G tin is Novartis's G tin. Um, we then have that batch number when we scan it, it, it just haven't put the batch number out there. So what, what should we do? And they said we can detect it, but what should we show? Uh, should we show the leaflet or not? Currently we are, but in our new development that we've just done, um, we haven't, we, we can opt to show the leaflet or not. It depends on a lot of maybe country or there could be policy reasons why you should or should not do such a thing. Then number nine is the GTIN is not known at all. So you scan this and it's just some number that's made up. It's nobody knows about it. And this is these are the kind of scenarios where we may look to link in with the GS1 digital link. Um, in order to maybe we pass that information to them and say, do you know who the owner of this is and work from that point of view? OK, so um, I'm going to try and share my screen now. Uh, Dan, maybe you could sh stop sharing and let me share. I'm not sure if I can share. And then I would like to just give you the demo. OK, uh, this won't take too long, so please let me know when you can see my screen. OK, I, I believe you can see my screen now, right? OK. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. We have a number of, you can see from here, we have a number of apps. Uh, we got the one for Japan, we got the one for the GI 4.0, we got some other stuff too. Um, and the one I'm going to show you now is this uh, DPI, the progressive web app. That's the one we were developing. There's also be a native one for Android and iOS. Um, the tech colleagues can give us more details on that as needed. So when I start it up, I, it'll look like something like this. Now, this app was purely developed just to show the functionality that we can deliver. Um, it wasn't it, it it wasn't meant to be the one that the patient will ultimately get. We're looking at their whole the UX experience from that perspective. Okay, so in the bottom left hand corner, you can see a data matrix code. So we we, we press that. It'll ask us, do you want to? It will have access to the camera. So the first thing I'm going to do is scan the Novartis product. Okay, so I scan this, and it'll come up and it'll give me the information here. This has got a patient information and a, an SMPC as well. You'll also see that um, it gives all the details about the batch number. 
the GTIN, etc. You will also notice the company name is Novartis One. The reason for this is, is our test system, and we're also testing the divestment of digital assets. So what happens if Novartis, for example, produce, we had this and then we divested to MSD, for example, what would need to happen in those scenarios? Who's liable for what? You can also see the, no, the serial number is verified and then the product status. That needs to get changed because I think a lot of people get confused with that and the with the term we use in the e for the EU hub and the national systems. So basically what this is saying, there's nothing wrong with the serial number or the expiration date. Um, then I click on the patient information button and we, we're using this standard here. Now this is the SPL from the US, um, but we are open to using any other standard that would be made available. This is this will be a very challenging area for going digital. So you can just click on it and you can get all the information as to what it contains, etc. Now this product also has an SMPC. Um, so well, the reason we did this was just to show we can show more than one document if needed. OK, we, ha we have all the relevant information. Again, this is done in the same way. So this was that was the Novartis product. Now I'm going to scan the next product here is uh, my, the GSK product. And again, I scan this is presented in the same way. Um, same thing for the patient. Everything is OK. Uh, the patient, the patient information. The dosage forms, they can go through all this, all these different areas that we can we can look at to find. OK, so that that's how we present to it. So it's, we're trying to do it in a more patient friendly way, not just put a PDF on glass. And we're also looking to enhance this as well as to what's what could be possible for us to do. Um, the next one, then I, I just quickly go through this one. This is the Merck product. Um, we scan this again, presented in the same way. We go to the patient leaflet here and then in the recent major changes, we can see we have three recent major major recent changes made. OK. I, I don't actually know what they are, but that's what the, that was says there are three of them. Now the next pack I'm going to scan is the same GTIN. So you can see that it ends in 3740. It's a different batch number. I scan this product again, presented the same way. It's, um, it's the kit through the product from uh, I click on my um, information here and the recent major changes. I have four recent changes. So this could potentially say oh, this product has um, peanut in it or it could say lactose or whatever the change is, whatever would be relevant for the patient because we need to give the patient the correct information at all times. The next one now we're coming into the unhappy path scenarios. This is an unknown serial number. We check this and it says it's failed. Okay, So we're checking that this serial, this serial number wasn't part of the batch and a lot of the questions we get is do we check against MMO etc. Right now we don't check against MMO. Uh, there's various reasons for that uh, because obviously when we when a Dispensed, it gets a different status. Uh, so, but it, it could potentially be looked at. The next one then is similar here. Uh, the expiration date is wrong in the code. I scan this. Now we are showing the leaflet here, as you can see. We, we've seen it's r the wrong expiration date, but really, should we show the leaflet in this example? These are the questions that we're asking. Uh, and then we have the next scenario here is this product has passed its expiration date. So there's actually nothing wrong with this apart from it's expired. So we can detect that it has expired. So should we show a message to the patient to say this, this is something wrong here um, or the product has expired, please dispose of it or bring it back to the pharmacy or wh whatever the message should be. Then we have the, the last two scenarios I'm going to show you here is this is a unknown batch number. So this was a Novartis GTIN, let's call it like that, but that batch number was not known to us. Novartis didn't put it up there. So we now can detect that this batch number is not known. Um, and then we we just show this message. This is not, it's not particularly useful or anything right now, but it's the principle is to show we can do it. And then we show the latest leaflet that's available there. Now the question is, should we show this or should we not show it? That there, These are the things to be answered. And then the last one here is the unknown GTIN. So in this case, this number is not known by anyone. We scan it now and this is the, the current message we get. Now this is not particularly useful to the patient. So what would be an appropriate message? Because it could be that is a fake product it, or a potential falsified product. It could be that the company is not participating in the platform. There could have been a technical issue. What do you do in all of these different scenarios? So that's essentially what we have done so far. Um, any questions on that or anything? No, there's only a more general question. I think we'll take that later. OK, I suggest we move on to Marco. Yeah, yeah. so I will start presenting and um, thank you for your time. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Uh, this is Marco Cuomo from Novartis. 
I'm an architect in Novartis and responsible for blockchain, and I'm co-leading with Seneca from Axologic um, the architecture for Pharma Ledger. Can you go to the next slide, Dan? Um, so this is the high-level um, architecture picture we, we like to show, the different layers. Um, I, I start at the bottom explaining you the idea behind the Pharma Ledger platform. Important is Pharma Ledger platform is not a monolithic blockchain um, technology or platform. It is more dynamic and flexible. So that means uh, when you look at the bottom layer, we call that hierarchical blockchains. We do not have one blockchain for everything. We believe in that it has to be um, supporting any kind of blockchain technologies. In that example here, on that picture, you see we have for use case one, um, uh, an Ethereum-based platform. Let's say this is EPI. So at the moment in EPI, we use Quorum. In another use case, let's say use case two, we can use Hyperledger Fabric, or we can also have combinations of use cases uh, where we two or three uh, use cases are using the same uh, blockchain technology or blockchain network. The blockchain network can also be public or private or hybrid. In the case of EPI, which you see, saw before, um, it's a hybrid blockchain means um, everyone can read it. Only um, certain companies, in this case, pharma companies or manufacturers can write to the blockchain, um, hence hybrid. Uh, so we need the permission um, system and onboarding process. As I said, um, each use case can come up with their own blockchain technology. So we are agnostic to the technology. Also, as we think in the future, we will have more um, technologies coming up, which looks interesting. Already now, we are looking at new technologies like Avalanche or Cordana. Uh, which, which have interesting features, especially around the consensus model and performance. Um, hierarchical blockchain means that we want to link them in what we call a root blockchain. The root blockchain then guarantees that um, the, the quality of the root blockchains are inherited to the below blockchain, for example, security, uh, governance, etc. So this is the blockchain Technology Foundation, the next layer is that what I think Pharma Ledger makes spe uh, um, special or specific is um, that we have something what we call open DSU. We, the DSU stands for data sharing unit. Um, we have a philosophy that we say we do not store data on the blockchain itself due to several reasons. One is GDPR, one is performance and, and many other things. Um, and anyway, that is uh, kind of best practice at the moment in the blockchain space. So we have a, a way how to store data off chain. In the example before with the EPI, for example, the, the data, the e-leaflet and other informations are not stored directly on the blockchain. They are stored in what we call a data sharing unit. The data sharing unit is a kind of a container with the data. And as a, uh, something special also with some code, but I think that goes too far for the moment. And this data sharing unit is then anchored in the respective blockchain. And with that, the data inherit all the properties from a blockchain um, network. The data sharing units are the data sharing units are, of course, encrypted and signed, so you can store them wherever you like. Uh, it is useless without the necessary, without the keys to read them. Um, the Open DSU is also, you can see that also as a kind of a framework for developers supporting different features. We have listed here certain, uh, some of them like the bricking, which means we put the data sharing units in a storage. We call the storage then bricks. Um, the anchoring, as I mentioned before, notifications between the data sharing units and something called what we call blockchain domain name service and other things. So this is the open DSU is our magic um, bullet, so to say, to make sure that the underlying technology, it can be looked at as an abstraction agnostic 
And on top of it, of the OpenDSU, we offer for uh, the business developers a standard API where they can then create their blockchain application with their um, with their stack, um, normal SDKs, whatever they need, etc. So the the web, a, a, web APIs and SDKs and the applications, these are two typical layers which the business developers need. The, the key here is the open DSU SDK, so to say, which is um, a framework to access the, the blockchain. Uh, the blockchain yeah. below. Hey, Marco, we, we have a question yeah. here which probably relates to more of the lower part of the slide. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and is what specific blockchain platform or platforms does the Pharma Ledger use and why? So, at the moment, as I said, we can use any kind of blockchain technology. Um, at the moment, for EPI, we are using Quorum, which is based on Ethereum. Um, the, the reason for, for the picking Quorum at the moment is Ethereum is well known. Um, there is a good community around it. It's good um, understandable. And the performance for EPI um, is, as you could see before, is, is very good. If we grow, it could be that we, we, we may have to look in, in other technologies where, may, where there is um, a faster consensus protocol, for example, for clinical uh, for, for the supply chain in general, for track and trace. So it could be for other use cases that we look in, in other technologies. At the moment, we have we look a little bit in something completely new, which is called Avalanche. It looks uh, a very interesting blockchain technology with uh, interesting consensus protocol, which is important when it comes to speed. I hope I answered the question. Okay. Okay, then um, let's move on to the next slide. So here a quick overview um, um, regarding OpenDSU. So Pharma Ledger platform architecture is based on the OpenDSU. I mentioned that before. It's the thin layer which gives us the freedom on for the for for, for the picking the right blockchain technologies and being uh, agnostic to the technology but also gives enough um, features for the, for the business developers on top of it. OpenDSU is not an invention of, of Pharma Ledger. It is something started already in 2015 with another European-based project or funded project was called Private Sky. What we do now is we bring that from a, let's say, academic research area in, in, in a very practical area. So we, we, do, we do now big steps forward with OpenDSU to make it um, a mature technology for, for the pharma industry. Um, we also try to find a home for OpenDSU. It looks like that we go in the direction of IDSA, which is called, which is the International Data Space Association, to create there a community, which is then um, goes um, wider or, uh, or bigger than pharma lecture. Um, the core ideas of OpenDSU, I mentioned them before, but I quickly touched them here again. Um, one is in the middle here is the data sharing units. That's the absolute key. We anchor, we store data off chain in a, in a kind of a container. We encrypt this container and we sign it. To do that, we need something what we call here key SSI. You can think about it something like an identifier. You, you heard before from Patrick the word anchor ID, for example. So technically speaking, it's, it's something like um, decentralized identifiers, identifier. We have also the idea of, we, we created the word self sovereign application. So everything what you saw is, is based on a wallet, is a complete control of the user. So, um, so this is these are the core ideas behind OpenDSU. So, what what you what I presented before is really just a little uh, glimpse out of it. Um, I, I'm not sure from a time point of view. I'm, I guess I already, uh, already used the ten minutes, and I think we we can stop here, Dan. Good. The other thing are just more details, which I'm not sure if it's uh, of value today here. Maybe this slide, this is basically our vision at the end. 
to have what we call an open DSU smart wallet. Because every anytime you do something with a blockchain, you need a wallet. The wallet is nothing magic. It's a piece of application handling your keys and data. The idea would be that with the smart wallets, we were, would be able to create applications. Um, we call them SS apps. I mentioned that before. You could see here in that example that we would have several different SS apps. For example, medical data, um, credentials in general, currencies. Um, other DSUs for tickets, cards, etc. And the, the, the cool thing would be here, instead of having for each of them a proprietary wallet, you could have one. They could, um, con there would be, they could communicate um, um, between themselves and could exchange data or information and you have it under control. And if someone develops a new, um, I call it SS app, a new app for the wallet. You can just load it into it and you would just have one app. It, it looks like then kind of a browser, but it would be a technology like a, a app, so a, um, a wallet. And um, so this is a little bit our vision in the future. So, but um, I think I stop here now. Super, thanks a lot, uh, Marco. I think we, we have a more general question maybe, maybe for Dan in that uh, lots of what we've seen now depend on the serialization data, but are there use cases where the consensus feature of blockchain is leveraged? Uh, I mean, I think that the, this is maybe more of a question for Marco. I think we, we want to have consensus um, on all writing transactions, you know, that these, these are validated. So, um, that's uh, maybe Marco. Do you want to? But maybe uh, maybe I can add. If you think about sure. some of the clinical use cases where you talk about the electronic consent, I mean that that's not at all depending on serialization data. So that's where there's more a, a consent and under the the relevant legal framework. But maybe Marco, you want to chip in? I'm not sure if I understand exactly the question. So so. Um, the the technology offers a, a lot of different things. We we can do this e-consent is one of the use cases. In this case, uh, we use blockchain for the e-consent to track and trace the different changes or signature on 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 the consent form itself, so that you later can find out who signed when, which version of the consent, the form, and this is this is kind of a notary service if you if you like. Um, but I'm not sure if I understood the question correct. Um, I think you did. Then we have uh, we have a question which relates a little bit to what maybe uh, Jimena is is online. She can ask it her, herself. So um, when a patient buys a batch at the pharmacy. Um, so that, can we use that information? I think the answer is yes. We 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 can capture that information. It's then up to the to the society and, and future evaluation to see how it will actually be used. But maybe I can jump in here quickly. At the moment, the EPI app is collecting no data. It's completely anonymous. That is very important to us. We can, of course, collect the data, but we do not. And it's designed at the moment in the way that we have no collection of any kind of data. And that's also, um, there was a question about the GS1 link. Um, we do not use GS1 link because at the end, you end up somewhere in a mapping table and in a central server service who then can, or which can then um, track and find out who has which question done or requests done. In our case, with the anchor ID, there is no information. The anchor ID is just a random, um, just numbers. You cannot find out who did which request for which e leaflet. So at the moment, completely anonymous. Yeah, it's Patrick. I would just like to add that the reason for this is we're very conscious of um, the socially stigmatized diseases, etc., as well. Um, so that that's one of the key principles we have for EPI. Should we end with a very general question then probably for Dan this time, will it be possible to develop further initiatives or use cases for pharma ledger post 2022? 
Absolutely. That's the whole idea. This platform should be extensible and scalable to uh, any more um, use cases. We think these are some good ideas for use cases, but I bet the best ones are still to come. And we need you to come with those ideas. <laughs> well, thank you for presenting a lot of... Uh... I've actually learned something new today that I've actually seen a 2D barcode become a 3D example on my iPhone. So thank you for that. It actually <laughs> jumped right out of the screen into my phone. So that was really an interactive way to engage us in uh, in, in ex uh, fully understanding what this can actually do. So uh, applaud for that. I think I would have a number of questions that we may come up with at a later point in time, but I, I think I'm very keen on, on learning more in the future about the governance, the future, the human technology interaction that needs to happen around the EPI and making sure that people fully understand that and use that and embrace that. Uh, so I, I think there's a really interesting future ahead. Uh, one wish from here, as we are a data analytics center, so use cases that revolve around the ability of doing analytics on blockchain data itself. So the events stamped onto the blockchain and what that would look like. And I, I think you guys probably know some of the audit trail thinking where that could visualize what actually happened and you want to reproduce certain elements of events not necessarily the last mile to the patients on, on the EPI, but in many other cases, uh, that could really, really be interesting uh, to look at that. And hopefully the future will allow you even more work on the, on this. I think three years is really, f it's, it's going fast, right? So um, okay. I think you get a bunch of things ahead of you uh, still, but really appreciate the time uh, you took today to present this, going all the way from concrete examples into the architecture and the details. Um, that was a treat. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Appreciate that, Thank you. that you took the time. So take care and uh, talk to you soon again. And for those watching online or later, uh, there are probably a lot of possibility to reach out to PharmaLedger if you get any questions. So please make note of the uh, PharmaLedger.eu link. So uh, reach out, I think it's safe to say, if you get any questions or comments uh, for that. Mm -hmm. So, but thank you. And uh, see you soon again. Yeah. Bye. Thank, Thank you. All. you. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.